on in. Pull batch is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host, here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, incredibly enough, thegaminggang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So welcome aboard. Tonight is Tuesday, September 6th, 2022. This is live stream 825. If this is your first time joining me, let me point out. Super, super casual around here. Just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news and normally taking a look at a tabletop game. So it's not as if we are taking part in rocket surgery or anything like that. And, of course, tonight's going to be no different as I take a first look and page through Book of Ebon Tides from Cobalt Press. Yes, this is for 5th edition. This is brand spanking new. This successfully kickstarted and uh, has made its way to backers. And, of course, you can also order it from Cobalt Press as well. So we are going to dive in and take a look at Book of Ebon Tides tonight. Tomorrow, we're going to stick with Cobalt Press and take a first look at Tales from the Shadows. <laughs> Should also point out, if you're not familiar with this stream... We tackled the tabletop gaming news first. So it's going to be probably about 30, 35 minutes before we jump in and start taking a look at Book of Ebon Tides. So if you're watching live, kick back, put your feet up, relax. I'm sure you probably had a long day or long holiday weekend. Maybe you need to recuperate a little bit. So take it easy on yourself. If you are watching this 30 minutes or more after the stream ends, there will be timestamps. So if you want to skip past the tabletop gaming news, you certainly can. And depending on the device you happen to be watching this with, those timestamps might be built right into the timeline of the video itself. So all you got to do is touch it or click on it and you'll be all set. Yes. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. And finally, this is a live stream. So that means there is chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways that I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. Plus, you also have to be a subscriber to the channel and be a subscriber for at least 48 hours before you can take part in chat. Yet another way that I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But if you want to say howdy, maybe you got a question, a comment, by all means, chime in. I will do my best to respond. So far, first out the gate was Mr. Eddie T. Yes, one of our chat moderators, Mr. Eddie T is with us. Testy Trekkie. Connor Dunning, MC, Coco B, Jason Bratley, and Sarah D poked her head out to say hello. And Flaming Heron's with us also. So three of our four chat moderators are hanging out right now. Noise, noise. MC said they pre-ordered Book of Ebon Tides. Can't wait to finally get a look inside. Yes, we will be doing that 
in just a little bit. Kathy Evans is popping into chat as well. So chat is off and rocking already. Nice. Very, very nice. Just taking a quick peek here. So Tessie Trekkie says between me here, Ben Milton at Questing Beast and Dave Thormavore, Thormavore. I'm not familiar with Dave. It's a great day for RPG news and reviews. Cool beans. Sweet. Very, very nice. Uh-oh. Jason says their uh, stream is stuttering. Let's take a look here. Okay, we look good. Now, the reason why I said let's take a peek is because the software that I use for the stream just updated today. You know how that is. Always seems to mess with stuff. But I double-checked a few things, so we should be okay. Because usually what will happen is the audio will be out of sync. That's one of the things that happens. Uh, the other thing that it likes to do is it likes to, like, delete the stream key for YouTube so that my stream and my chat are two separate things. So I'll be, I could be streaming and chat is there and people are like, hey, where's Jeff? He must be running late today. And I'm like, yeah, I'm in the middle of doing, doing a show. But that hasn't happened. So, you know, knock on wood. I think we should be all right. Christopher Rush has popped on in as well. They are cooking in the background. There you go. Nice. Connor says they bought a book yesterday, but only after they checked my review. Perhaps they should have reversed that order as uh, the same complaints. Oh, okay. So hey, I, I, no, I, I, I didn't emphasize correctly on that. So I guess Connor bought a book and then took a peek at my review after he placed his order. And, uh, I guess it wasn't uh, it wasn't a glowing review, I guess. <laughs> Jason says, uh, now they're in the UK. They have great speeds, but sometimes rubbish service as far as their internet service providers. Yeah, I think that's everywhere. I think that I really do think that is everywhere. So hopefully everybody here in the US who's hanging out watching had a wonderful Labor Day weekend. Hope you enjoyed that extra day off. Hopefully you got that extra day off. And if you're outside the U.S., I hope you had a wonderful weekend. Sweet. So let's jump on into the news because I've got a nice eclectic mix, as usual. Coming to the States later this year is the soccer slash football simulation 11. From Portal Games, here's the skinny. 11, the number of players you have on the pitch at any given time, with those players making all the difference between being the best team and the worst. But every team knows that to be the best in the league, it takes a lot more than players. It also takes an incredible manager. 11, football manager board game, is an economic strategy game set in a world of sport. Your task is to manage and grow your own football club over the course of the season. During the game, you hire staff members, including trainers, physical therapists, PR specialists, and directors. You acquire sponsors, expand the stadium infrastructure, and take care of your club's position in social media. Among the many tasks on the list are transferring new players and choosing the right tactics for each of the upcoming matches. 11 can be played multiplayer or solo. The solo mode includes six different scenarios that challenge players with different starting situations and goals for the season. In the beginning, the task is simple. You have to climb the steps of the football leagues and achieve the appropriate experience. You may have to manage the cub, cub, club in a crisis, and at other times, you will have to rejuvenate a football team of players that are not so young anymore. You may also have to fight against time to try to complete the stadium before the deadline. 
11 is for one to four players, ages 14 and up. Plays in around 60 minutes. I would assume with more players, it's going to take longer than an hour. It's going to carry an MSRP of $50 when it arrives in Q4. Yes, yes. Got to also point out, Portal Games has like six expansions for this. So there are, there's an expansion for like international leagues. There's uh, uh, like an events expansion. There's a lot of stuff going on with this. And this was a very, very successful. It wasn't a Kickstarter. It was, I think it was on GameFound, if I remember correctly. But I got to say, over the years, I have played a lot of football manager. <laughs> Even though I'm not exactly a big, you know, soccer fanatic or anything like that. But it is loads of fun. I'm a big sim person anyway. This could be very, very cool. I'm very curious because I, I sort of have the impression that the results of the matches aren't as important as the rest of the things going on, the rest of your goals that you're going to have. Jason says they love football, or as some people like to say, footy. I can let it happen elsewhere, and I don't even complain. So let's see. So Flaming Heron says we're all generally armchair sportsmen. Yeah, I played softball back in the day, but uh, that was about it. Yes. So anyway, keep your eyes peeled and got to say, this looks like this is going to have, this is supposed to be what you're seeing right now. That is supposed to be the retail edition. So that looks like there's a lot in there for those 50 bones. So stay tuned. Hitting stores this week for Gale Force 9 is Starfinder Pirates of Stardock. Here's the skinny. You've got your crew, know the right folks, and even have a line on a potential financial backer who might grease the right palms to set you on the path to becoming a top-rate pirate. You're just missing one thing, a ship. Lucky for you, you happen to know there's a top-of-the-line vessel with all the newest tech sitting in dock just waiting for an enterprising individual to take it out among the stars. Of course... If you know that, others do too. And there can only be one captain. There can be only one. Will you become the newest pirate to set sail among the stars? In Starfighter Pirates of Sky Dock, players compete to be the one to successfully pull one of the greatest heists of all time off. Players take turns moving around the ship to complete objectives and gain the support they need to be recognized as the new captain. Over the course of the game, players build their characters to suit their style of play. When the ship launches, one of the players will emerge victorious, providing the ship doesn't go into lockdown first. Pirates of Sky Dock tells the story of several Starfinder adventurers trying to seize a new vessel. Players must accomplish several tasks to steal the ship. Doing so will require a combination of glory, crew support, and potentially external backers. The adventurers can work together to accomplish their goals, but only the character with the greatest glory will win the bet and become captain. Of course, if security gets too high, the ship will lock down and no character will become captain. Starfinder Pirates of Stardock is for two to four players, ages 14 and up, Plays around 60 to 90 minutes. Going to carry an MSRP of $60 when it hits stores later on this week. Yes. Jason says that the city that he lives in has the oldest football team in the world. And Mr. Eddie T says, Jeff, I thought you were a little league coach. Yes, I know. I have been accused of being a little league coach. I don't, I don't know if that was, you know, I guess that was supposed to hurt my feelings. I really didn't care. So it's like, whatever. So Tessie Trike says, space pirate alien ninjas. 
Yes, that is, I believe, one of the characters. On to some wargaming news. Currently up on the GMT Games P500 pre-order list is Iron Storm. Here's the scoop. Iron Storm is a two-player strategic war game that allows you to recreate the entire First World War in a single afternoon, three to five hours. The game uses an innovative card engine system where each player uses their entire hand in one go to activate armies, resolve operations, and support battles with combat cards. It also simulates human and economic attrition during the course of the war by gradually adding cards to each deck that will have limited use in the hand and take additional effort to remove. Bit of a deck building aspect to this, I see. Iron Storm has been designed to be as simple as possible in terms of rules and has no exceptions to remember that are not indicated on the cards or the board. It is equally suitable as an introductory war game or as a tight duel for experienced players. This features an innovative card play system that keeps the game moving quickly while simulating war weariness and exhaustion through the addition of attrition cards to both players' decks. A quick and exciting battle system uses custom dice to determine the impact of artillery with outcomes slightly unpredictable, but still deterministic enough to plan your turn around. Random events depict external political, industrial, and military factors that both players must adapt their strategy in response to. Also includes four scenarios, allowing for variable game length, with even the full arc of the Great War in Europe being playable in an afternoon. Iron Storm is for one or two players. That's right. There is a solo component to this using the new GMT uh, card-driven games solo module. So there is that. It's for ages 14 and up, plays in three to five hours, and can be pre-ordered right now for $55 with an eventual MSRP of $79. I am very, very intrigued. I like the map. I like the board. The board looks very, very cool. And I am a big fan of card-driven war games. This seems like another definite gateway game to keep your eyes peeled for because it is not just a traditional hex encounter game. And I say it all the time, and I know people get mad about it, but in order to grow the hobby of wargaming, because the vast majority of wargamers are gray beards, I don't have a gray beard, but if I did, I'd be in that, you know, category. Gotta, gotta change things up. Can't have just, you know, the regular old... NATO iconography and attack factor, defense factor, movement factor, and a bunch of hexes. It doesn't bring people into the hobby. Things like Flashpoint, South China Sea, which I will talk about after the news because I was going to get a chance to play that this weekend. And I'll tell you what happened. And also Iron Storm. This is another gateway game that really does look very, very interesting. I am not sure if those are the final cards, though. I think those are still kind of prototype. I might be wrong, but I kind of think a little bit of a prototype there. Kevin R. Smith is with us. John Vogel has popped on in just in time for some war gaming news. John must be psychic. It's like, oh, I got, I, I got to check out the stream tonight. Just as I start talking about a uh, P500 title for GMT games. Kevin says there's a small local convention run by a wargaming club. So many of them have beards as gray as mine. They all look like Gandalf. <laughs> Gandalf the gray. So, yeah, not the white. The white, he's a little too cleaned up. So... <laughs> Talk about some role-playing game news. 
because available right now in PDF is the latest issue of the D12 monthly magazine from Yum DM. Yum. Here's the deets. This is issue 16 of the successful zine D12 monthly. This issue is all about weapons. A zine for fans of the longest running role playing game or any fantasy tabletop role playing game in the same vein as the role playing magazines of old. You'll find articles intended to spur on ideas for your own campaign. This zine is available free from the website, but you can have all your tabletop role playing game stuff in one place by picking up this issue. I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if all this content is available for free over on the Yum DM website. It is possible. But this issue does contain GAW, a list of weapons made from natural substances, including monster parts from beyond the grave. Weapons made by necromancers from undead. Shield Bash. Rules on using shields as weapons. Have at ya! Simple rules for using improvised weapons. Blessed they be. Holy weapons and how they differ from magic weapons. Different strokes. Weapons tags to add spice to your weapons. And much more. The 24-page PDF of the September issue of D12 Monthly is available at drive through RPG right now for $4. So check it out if you are playing fantasy role-playing games or uh, OSR. Seems This seems to have a bit of a an OSR bent. I don't necessarily think it's a lot of 5e stuff. Now, I could be completely wrong. I don't know. Jason says that they're annoyed they're 50 this year and Gandalf still hasn't turned up to sign Jason up for an adventure. <laughs> Coco B says, yeah, you'll, you would probably have to be in New Zealand though. So Mr. Eddie T says, oh, but Tolkien said the Shire was actually England. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about Tolkien right now. Mm hmm. I am not going to touch that discussion. Not at all. My final news piece Swords of the Serpentine from Pelgrane Press is available now in print and PDF. Here's the latest a gumshoe role playing game of swords and sorcery. When it's summer, you smell her before you see her. As you come around the curve of the Serpentine River, the scent of the open sea is replaced by the stench of low tide, of boat tar, of rare spices spilled from a smuggler's ship, of cooking smoke and human waste. Bells ring out across the water and echo like the song of ghosts, loud enough to almost drown out the chanted prayers of your ship's towers. Oh, I'm sorry, ship's rowers. Towers? Where did I get that from? You're on the bend past the lower fort, and there she is, the great city of Eversink, sprawled out on scores of islands across the sheltered water. Her jeweled and crystal turrets are reflected in a shimmering bay full of hundreds of brightly colored boats. Architecture from a dozen era tower above a tangle of grand plazas and narrow canals. Temples to her goddess rise above the mansions and tenements, calling her people to prayer. She may be ancient and corrupt, slowly and ex extorably swallowed by an endless bog, but she's alive in a way most cities aren't. She's a melding of faith in stone and wood and water and mud that's unique in all the world. Doesn't matter whether you've come to kill a rival, earn a fortune, learn a secret, or hire an army. You're home now and the sinking city will embrace you. All you need to do is survive. Swords of the Serpentine is a sword and sorcery game of daring heroism, sly politics, and bloody savagery set in a fantasy city rife with 
Skullduggery and death. I always like that word, skullduggery. The rules adapt the gumshoe investigative role-playing system to create a fantasy role-playing game with a focus on high-action role-playing and investigation inspired by the stories of Fritz Leiber, Terry Pratchett, Robert E. Howard, and others. Your characters will discover leads that, if followed, propel them headlong into danger and forbidden knowledge. A lead might point the way to sunken treasure, jungle ruins, the missing key to a sorcerer's trap, or the true identity of a notorious murderer. The gumshoe game mechanics ensure that you'll always notice leads if you look for them. It's up to you to choose which one you'll follow into whatever perils lie ahead in hopes of fortune, glory, justice, or just staying alive another day. Do you want to track down foul sorcerers in a corrupt and decadent city? Clamber through underground ruins to sneak into an enemy's home and rob them? Or wage a secret war against a rival political faction? You're in the right place. The 392-page hardcover for Swords of the Serpentine is available for $59.99. And now... You can grab the PDF over at Drive Through RPG for $29.95. Well, <laughs> Dusty Drake, he says the new Amazon Prime series, yes, Rings of Power, is very boring. <laughs> uh, I will I'll discuss that after we wrap up the news. I'm not going to get into the whole other racism thing because I think it's a bunch of nonsense. But whatever. Everybody's got to, you know, get their panties in a bunch over stuff. All right. Tessie Trek, he says, a gumshoe action game. Hmm. More, yet more stuff to buy. <laughs> so what I understand, and I got to be honest, I don't know a whole lot about uh, Swords of the Serpentine. But it is obviously inspired by Lankmar and like urban Conan adventures. Probably I would even take a stab Michael Moorcock's Elric series with like the Young Kingdoms and things like that. So my understanding is that the like the the system where you like spend points to acquire clues. It's been a long time since I, I've reviewed a, a gumshoe title, but I guess that's been tweaked more towards like the action. So you can actually spend points to do really cool things in combat or, you know, do like heroic sort of things that are out of the ordinary. So that's what I think that whole, uh, like usually have like a, uh, like a pool of points that you can utilize uh, within a, a certain amount of time uh, in gameplay, right? You, you might have so many per session or you might have so many per axe because Gumshoe kind of plays an axe. It's one of those sort of role-playing games. But I got to say, it, it does sound very, very interesting. It's been out for a while in print and there are some reviews out there and once again we talk about reviews all the time you never know right but a lot of people have been very very impressed by it so now that it's available in pdf i thought i would share that with you as well because i'm a huge fritz Leiber fan i love me Fofford and the Grey Mouser. Those are my favorite fantasy stories of all time. I like Conan. I like Robert E. Howard stuff. Funny enough, I actually like the Solomon Kane stories better than I do Conan. Even though there are some real classic Conan stories, there are also some that were like written on autopilot. <laughs> They're like, my God, this thing's the same goddamn story. It's like the last one. 
Because I have, uh, I've, I've mentioned it before, I've got all of Robert E. Howard's like short stories and that on audiobook. So I've got the, the three volumes of Conan stories, and they are actually in the order that they were released so that they were published, not chronological order. So I've got um, Call, I've got Solomon Kane, I've got his horror stories in a collection. I've got uh, Bran MacMuller, which I actually have not listened to. But, you know, pretty solid. I mean, there are some, there are some seriously good Conan stories, but then there are also some seriously bad ones, too. Coco B says they haven't watched Rings of Power yet. Only the videos complaining about it. Kevin says, I kind of agree with the meme that said, basically, if you watch a show with elves, dragons, or lightsabers, but can't imagine people of color in that setting, the problem is you and not the casting choice. I agree. I certainly, I definitely agree with that. Although, okay, so I'll, I'll finish so, uh, Tessie Trek, he says, if their issue with Rings of Power is they made the elves black and Asian and some of them have gay coding, I'm ignoring it. If it's that the series is boring <laughs> as BS, then yeah. So, Mr. Eddie T says they're not into fan fiction, so they won't be watching Rings of Power. Hadn't heard the uproar about the show, but it doesn't surprise me. MC says that they watch a lot of Tolkien lore videos. And since Rings of Power started, they've had to block so many shuddly YouTube channels complaining about woke Amazon. Only thing that I, I have issues with, and it, it has nothing to do with Rings of Power. I have problems with, uh, it's, it's film mainly. I don't really see this in TV, but where they take an established character and there's, there's one case in point that just really left me scratching my head. And I mean, it just caused an, uh, just an uproar with fans, uh, is when they take an established character and then completely do like a gender switch or a racial switch for no other reason than to be like, oh yeah, look, look, we actually have a, an African-American on our, in our cast. And the big deal was when they made Johnny Storm African-American in the last Fantastic Four movie. And it was sort of like, why? Why did, why did you do that? If you wanted to do, if you wanted a black character, you're doing Fantastic Four. Black Panther wasn't out yet. I don't even think Black Panther was on the horizon. Why didn't they use Black Panther? It's like his original appearance is in Fantastic Four. It's like, what the hell's wrong with you people? Jason says they really thought the recent Orville season was good. Yes, I, I haven't finished it up. Uh, Kevin says people are also complaining it's not true to the lore of the Silmarillion, though the makers of the series don't have access to the Silmarillion for adaptation because Tolkien rights are complex. Yes, that they are. And they were just purchased by someone else. I'm sure most of you out there knew that, that the uh, Tolkien rights had been sold. Yep. So do not be shocked if the new edition of the One Ring from Free League Publishing hits some bumps in the road. So Simeon is with us saying Lou Ferrigno should play Wonder Woman in the next movie. Next time I see Lou, because he's at every comic convention I happen to ever go to, I'll mention that to him. I'll see that. So Kevin says, uh, Saul Zant sold them. I'm amazed. Yeah, there was an article a week ago, week and a half ago. Yeah, the, the rights to uh, Tolkien were sold. 
I was like, zoinks. Well, yeah. But what can you do? What can you say? All right. Anyway, so that was the news for tonight. Of course, I was talking about Swords of the Serpentine from Pelgrane Press being available over at Drive Through RPG in PDF. Don't forget the Gaming Gang Dust the Dispatch is affiliated with the One Bookshelf site. So if you are going to visit Drive Through RPG, by all means, please stop by the GamingGang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a small portion of that sale. And all those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up and help keep the GamingGang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you dig the channel, if you feel the GamingGang.com, the newly redesigned TheGamingGang.com is a valuable resource. Hell, if you just like what I do and the rest of the team too, head on over to paypal.me slash TheGamingGang and you can make a small donation. So thankfully, there are a lot of people out there who use those banner ads and there are also others who swing on by paypal.me and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. So, uh, Kevin says uh, the sale of the Lord of the Rings rights might be a good thing. Uh, Zance, not sure if it's spelled correctly, is reputed to be one of the most ruthless business people in Hollywood. I mean, he did sue John Fogarty for plagiarizing himself. <laughs> All righty. So we're going to be jumping into Book of Ebon Tides in just a couple of moments. First, I did want to point out, I was all set to do some gaming this weekend. Oh, yes. I was going to bust out Flashpoint South China Sea with my nephew Cameron. And all of a sudden he was like, oh. he called me and told me, oh, I'm not feeling too hot. I said, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, oh, well, you know what? I'll, I'll be okay. Might as well just come on over. And I was like, no, if you're sick, no, 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 we better, we better cancel. Well, he's got COVID. There's another COVID bullet I dodged. Second one that I'm completely aware of. There may be others that I, I dodged without knowing. But I'm like, wow, that was oh so close. But I mean, he's okay. He's fine. I mean, he just feels crappy. Is he? For him, it's like a bad flu. For other people, maybe not so much. Unfortunately, my best friend Elliot Miller is um, still dealing with the aftermath from COVID, so that is not cool. So, it's like, man, almost, almost ended up with it. So, yes, I. Um, did not have an opportunity to get any gaming done this weekend, but I did get some videos up. So there is my first look at the Pathfinder Lost Omens travel guide. So there is that. And then my review of the Castles and Crusades Players Handbook. So, of course, this is from Troll Lord Games. And obviously enough, this is from Paizo Inc. So definitely check those out. So far, this review's been pretty popular. I was kind of surprised. I mean, the game's been out for quite some time. But I uh, really liked it. I think it's very, very cool. And of course, I've got other reviews of other Castles and Crusades titles on the very near horizon. Simeon says, I hope uh, my nephew Cameron feels better soon. So do I. He'll, like I said, he, he should be fine. He should be fine. Jason says they want Muppets Lord of the Rings. Yes, Tessie Trekkie said check out Land of Eam. I think that Kickstarter's over, though. But yeah, that did look really interesting, didn't it? I shared a news piece about it. So, all righty then. So we're going to jump in with our first look in just a couple moments. But first, I think it's time... For a brief intermission.
It's intermission time. Time to pause and refresh at the snack bar. During this short break, you can treat your taste of good food and sparkling cold beverages, including delicious Coca-Cola. If you're hot dog hungry, we have them. Sizzling, juicy hot dogs served in warm, oven-fresh buns, plus a complete menu of all your favorites. Visit the Refreshment Center now. Enjoy delicious food and ice-cold Coca-Cola. Pizza! Pizza, pizza, pizza. Everybody loves pizza, and we're now featuring the famous original Tolona pizza. Only the finest and purest ingredients go into the original Tolona pizza, made fresh to your order. And into the oven it goes. Presto, a luscious, hot, crispy pizza. We're now featuring... Hey, wait a minute. Give me another pizza. <laughs> That's better. Now, as I was saying... We now have delicious, crispy Tolona pizza at the refreshment stand. What do you have? Cheese, sausage, or pepperoni? Take it away! Anybody who doesn't drink Wilkins coffee ought to be tarred and feathered, right? Wrong! He always was a bad sport. Hiya, Marinda Craver. Hey, Bruno, would you give me a frosty, sparkling orange Marinda? If you can pick up this thousand-pound dumbbell. <laughs> okay, but you show me how. Yeah, you put one hand here and... Uh-oh. I'll hold bubbly, delicious Marinda for you. Gee, thanks. <clears throat> Ooh, Marinda orange. Good, 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 good. Hey, you ain't watching. Marinda. Good, 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 good. Good, 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 good. It's like, so, uh, the new update to the software I use for the stream, I guess I got to be careful because if I click off something, I can't, like, go right back to the scene I was at. That's why there was, like, a little bit of, like, dead air there for, for a few seconds. I'm like, what the hell? Come on, switch to me. Switch to me. What's going on? Hey, well, at least, uh, at least the stream hasn't dropped or anything like that. So I guess I shouldn't be complaining. All right. So tonight I am going to take a first look and page through the book of Ebon Tides from Cobalt Press. It is written by Wolfgang Bauer and Celeste Conowich. The 256-page hardcover is available. I believe it's available for order right now. I don't think it's in stores just yet. It might be, but I'm not positive. Or you can, of course, just grab the PDF alone for $29.99. If you want to grab the hardcover and the PDF, it is $5 more. It is $54.99 for that combo. So let's swing on over to the other camera because here I've got the Book of Ebon Tides. Yes. So we're going to jump on in this in just a moment. But first, a few things I do want to point out. First of all, the fine folks over at Cobalt Press were kind enough to provide me with this review copy. But neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this coverage with you. These days, it's important that you know that. I'm also going to stay picture-in-picture picture up here, as I always do. So that means I'll be cutting off a little bit of the upper left portion of the book as we page on through. We're not going to look at each and every page, but I do want to give you a good feel for what's in Book of Ebon Tides. So let's... Take a peek at the back as I see Kabuki Kid is here in chat with us. Double K's in the house. Jason Brantley says, never trust a blue Muppet. <laughs> All righty. Step beyond the veil into the shadow realm. The plane of shadow exists between... Oh, sh look at that. I can't even read tonight. The plane of shadow exists beside the mortal world. A twisted reflection of the material plane where fey magic, illusion, and trickery are as potent as steel. Heroes can enter this otherworldly realm of fey shadows, undead horrors, 
and wild adventure, but can they survive? And then it tells us what's in the book, which we're going to take a peek at anyway. Let's dive on in. Let's get some credit for our artists as well. So cover artist is Marcel Mercado. Oh, here we go. And I'm going to butcher names. Get ready. Other artists, George Johnstone, Mike Pape, David Auden Nash, William O'Brien, Roberto Pitero, Addison Rankin, Kiki Mock Rizki, Florian Stitz, Stites, Brian Syme, Israel Thompson, and Alexander Yakovlev. I don't know. I'm, I'm close. <laughs> I'm sure I butchered plenty of them. All right. So this is a setting book. And this is going to dive into the shadow realm. MC says, uh, Jeff, butchering names is why I'm here. That's why I try to stay away from sharing all the artists in that. But there weren't too many. So yeah, try to try to give them a little bit of a shout out because to be honest, very rarely do reviewers talk about the illustrators of these role-playing game books. So on the cover, a bear folk druid and a shadow fey rogue stand before a warding stone, safeguarding a changeling baby on their travels through the shadowy forest in this art by Marcel Mercado. Actually, I like that cover art. It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. So Flaming Heron says, Jeff, butchering all languages for 10 years. Yes, I even butchered uh, names on the podcast. So I've been butchering names in all languages for uh, more than a dozen years now. All right, so let's jump on in. This is part of the uh, Midgard setting. So I assume it's part of the Midgard setting because uh, in the Midgard setting, there are the shadow roads which uh, you're accessing the shadow realm and you can actually travel uh, much, much further, much, much faster on the shadow roads, but it is very, very dangerous. So, mm -hmm. so uh, counter says if people bookmark my uh, drive through RPG affiliate link, instead of the drive through homepage, their browsers should default to it. Just an idea. Actually, with my news pieces on thegaminggang.com, my affiliate link is always built in to the links. So I know a lot of folks out there, they'll watch the stream or they'll watch a review or what have you, and uh, they actually will go over to thegaminggang.com to click on a banner ad or go find the news piece for what I was talking about so they can get the link right there. All right, so it looks like we have this broken up into 10 sections. So overview and history, umbral people and heroes, heroes from the shadows, the magic of shadow and light, the nature of shadow, fake courts and servitors, realms beyond the courts, umbral pantheon, monsters and NPCs, as well as magic items and trickery. And then we'll have an appendix, life in the shadow realm, Shadow Realm Encounters and Creatures by Terrain. Looks like we get some tactical maps as well. So MC says, ah, yes, the Midgard setting, a.k.a. this week's plagiarizing for my own brew, Shadowfell one shot. I really like the Midgard setting. I, I say it all the time when we're looking at Cobalt Press stuff. I, I think it's a fun setting. I mean, it's, it's got kind of everything in the kitchen sink to it, but it works. And I, I think if you're looking to, to run or play in a high fantasy setting that's a little darker than what you would normally run across, not grim dark, but a little darker, I think you would do quite well with Midgard. Shadow is everything and nothing. It is gloom and delight. If you try to seize it, it ripples away, laughing. So yes, the plane of shadows is an uncertain place, which makes it a very difficult place to define and capture in maps and descriptions. 
in known quantities or certainties. Everyone knows that the demonic creatures of the hells are vile and secure in their malice. Likewise, the shining angels of the celestial halls are unyielding in their eternal pilgrimage for righteousness and law. These realms are well known and understood. The one is bright and the other Stygian. The creatures of shadow are far less defined and far more flexible and no less dangerous for all that. Sweet. Very nice. MC says, almost like some sort of realm that, that has been forgotten. I don't hate the forgotten realms. I, I got to be honest. I, I have a nostalgia for Greyhawk, really. All that Forgotten Realms stuff, that, that all came after I was out of D&D. So I, I say it all the time. When I was in high school, I think we played a little bit freshman year, and then that was it. I mean, I had played D&D before that. I actually started playing, I think I was in sixth grade when I played. Maybe I was in seventh. But by the time freshman year was around, Call of Cthulhu came out. So it was like, had that. Uh, I had friends running um, Top Secret. So, yeah, we kind of just turned our backs on AD&D. Although I, I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, I went to school in the same I, I think he was in the same year. No, he wasn't. He was, he was ahead of us, I think, by a year. Uh, Mike, Mike Nistel, or Nistel, who um, we won't really talk about too much because <laughs> I guess he, uh, I think he did some Kickstarters that he collected money on and never did anything. But, uh, he, he actually did some work for TSR. There were spells named after him. So he was, uh, he was the leader of our rival game club. He was president of our rival game club. I can't remember there. Maybe I think it was, I think they were the Dungeons and Dragons guild or something like that. And we were the gamers guild because we played other things. We didn't just play D and D. All they played was D and D. So yeah, kind of kind of funny little story. I know I've mentioned that once before. Simeon says Ed Greenwood frequents their hometown gaming con. He's actually from the area. I've met Ed a couple of times. He's very nice. I, he's got such a distinctive voice too. MC threw out uh, Nystel's magic aura. Yes, that's one of the spells. All right. So, a land of ebon tides. When learning about the shadow realm, the first element that must be addressed is not the people of the realm, but the immutable land itself. Most people of the mortal world think of the ground, the forest, and the mountains as permanent, and we think of shadows and light as transitory. And they are, usually, except when some bright e eternal fire wells up from the deep earth or some cavern remains shrouded in darkness for eons. In the, in the shadow realm, though, shadows are eternal, while land and rivers are, if not entirely transitory, notably less certain than they are in the mortal lands. Cool. And we're going to see some cool artwork. Oh, there's one of the bear folk. Throughout, that's one of the aspects I always like with the Cobalt Press releases. Artwork is always very, very solid. So, more discussion about the Shadow Realm, etiquette and status in the Shadow Realm. Shadow Realm is home to many unique creatures and species, but it is arguably best known as the home of the Shadow Fae. The Shadow Fae resemble other humanoids, such as humans or elves, but their culture is quite alien to most who live in the mortal world, being full of changing and confounding rituals, edicts, and rules. All right. So it looks like there are some status rules involved with the Shadow Realm. Uh, so Kevin says, yep, Nystel is the only real person to have an official D&D &D spell named after him. 
thought I thought he had a couple. I thought there were a couple. Of course, I might be completely wrong. I really didn't know him uh, outside of the fact that, you know, they disliked our club because they, they thought we were competitors for the for gamers. And it was like, I went to a high school with 5,000 students. Give me a break. It's like, wasn't like, oh, well, we got 100 kids in the school, you know? So MC says they like the concept of the Shadowfell being a dark Feywild. There's a lot of setting flavor to be mined there. So we're going to get into uh, some of the residents. So, of course... I reviewed the Empire of Ghouls adventure, which I really liked. I thought that was really well done. And there are some creatures here in the Shadow Realm that will easily fit in to uh, that, including ghouls. I think ghouls live in the Shadow Realm. Or uh, I might be wrong, but I thought they do. I'm not, I mean, they live in our realm mainly, but I thought they were also in the shadow realm. So I have heroes from the shadows. So this looks like we're going to get some different archetypes. Some new abilities, it looks like. I know he's got some new spells. So yeah, so we do have some new archetypes. That's kind of cool. Got an optional rule. Radiance Dispelling Shadow. Got some GM notes as well. Manipulating Shadow Landscape. Here are our new spells here. So we get our spell descriptions. Bitter Wind. Blade of Blood and Bone. Bright Sparks. Charnel Banquet. Child of Light and Darkness, Conjure Ferryman, Ebon Tide, Elf Shot, Fairy Toast. You and up to five other creatures make a toast and drink to the lords and ladies of the Fey Court. When you cast a spell, choose one of the following toasts and the targets of which must be within 10 feet of you throughout the casting. And you were thinking it was going to be Toast made out of bread. <laughs> MC says, okay, purple armored polar bear is their next NPC. And MC also points out the king. Can't, can't wait to get this. So it looks like we've got a lot of new spells. Nice. Okay, then we get section five, the nature of shadow. The foremost questions from many travelers to the shadow realm have to do with its shadow matter, its malleable nature, and how humans and other intelligent species survive in such a strange place. To natives, these questions are foolish, for the laws of nature may be different than they are on other planes or in the mortal realm, but the shadow realm is hospitable to those who take time to learn its ways. This chapter provides that foundation. Oh, sweet. That's, uh, I like that. That's pretty wild. There you go. Traveling on shadow roads, which I was talking about previously. That that's uh, one of the, the aspects of the Midgard setting. Fake courts and servitors. What is a fake court? A fake court is roughly similar to a human fiefdom a land ruled by a noble or monarch, that ruler embodying its people and attracting like-minded fey to their court. A small court, for instance, might style itself the Baron's Court of Millrun and rule over a handful of villages along a stream. A large court, such as the Court of Night and Magic, might have lesser courts that pay it fealty, be ruled by a queen, and command entire cities, forests, and small armies. So there you go. We're going to get a discussion of that. And I'm going to take a guess. We're going to get some examples of different fey courts. 
Kabuki Kid says, love the Frazetta painting with the polar bears pulling a sled ridden by a huge warrior. Yes. Frazetta had some just dynamite artwork. So it looks like, yep. So it looks like we've got some info about a handful of fey courts. We have the Court of the Golden Oak. We got a map of it and breakdown of various important areas. Court of the Mice and Ravens. Court of Night and Magic. That's the one that uh, just discussed discussing how how large it is. And it's ruled by a queen. Court of Winter's Love. Hmm. Okay. So like we've seen in other setting books, we get the coat of arms, a breakdown of the important NPCs, the population, what gods they worship, and so forth. So this is a, a bit of a gazetteer here. Kogo B says, yep, that Frazetta is van worthy. Connor says, blasphemy. There are only the courts of summer and winter. Winter is coming. Okay, so it looks like we've got, ooh, the splintered city of vampires. Yes. Nice. So it looks like this is a pretty large section of the book. All right, so then we're going to get into the... I thought there's a section here. It's the Book of Ebon Tides. Oh, no, here we go. Umbral Pantheon. So now we're going to have the various different... Gods and deities. A lot of artwork throughout. Very, very cool. And as we see, at least in the Cobalt Press releases that I've had an opportunity to take a look at, we also have cool stuff going on on the border. So even though it is the same art repeated and it's from the cover, I think that's pretty cool. The Black Goat of the Woods? Ooh. Little Lovecraftian right there. So MC says, this is the Shadowfell book Wizards of the Coast refuses to give us. Yeah, a lot of people have commented on my review of Spelljammer that it's all the, it's the third-party companies that are really putting together the cool 5e stuff including Cobalt Press. Okay, now we've got uh, Monsters and NPCs. Lesser Lunar Devil. Uma Rattenfanger, Keeper of the Plain. Hello, Uma. Or Oma. River Giant. Sable Elves. This looks like we've got quite a bit here. Shadow Goblin Scribe. Shadow Spider Swarm. Cool. So now we get into our magic items and trickery. So we're going to get some magic items here. Looks like we're not going to get a bunch of artwork, though, with these, which is kind of a cobalt press thing. I've noticed that in the past when we get into, I mean, it's not that they won't have any images, but I have noticed because, you know, a lot of releases from publishers when they have equipment, magic items, especially they'll, they'll try to have quite a bit of artwork, not necessarily so with Cobalt Press, which honestly really doesn't bother me much. It's like, you know, oh, wow, those are magic boots. Hmm, I think I know what boots look like. <laughs> Kabuki Kid says, I heard Witchlight was pretty good. Is it not? Personally, that's my favorite. 
of the adventure books that have come out in about the last five years from Watsy. So, so yeah, I, I personally like it quite a bit. Uh, a lot of people did not dig it because uh, it was not combat heavy at all. But that was one of the things I really liked about it because almost every, I mean, there were some, there were some encounters that you, you were going to have to resort to combat, but a vast majority of the challenges facing the player characters, they did not have to resort to violence, which I thought was very cool and very much in keeping with the fairy tale sort of vibe that was going on. All right, so now we're into the appendices. Cantrips of the Fae, Mounts in the Shadows. Strange Servants of the Shadows. Treasures and Trinkets of the Shadows. So we've got some of our encounters here. So encounters in the forests. We also have a challenge rating as well. Marshes and Rivers. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah, I'm just gonna <laughs> like just run barefoot through the grass. Oh yeah, okay. So these are Plains, Hills, and Mountain encounters. They have creatures by terrain. And it looks like some of these are here in the book, others are just traditional monster manual monsters. MC says you can actually run the entire adventure without doing any combat whatsoever with uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight. It was designed that way. Yeah, like I said, I enjoyed it. I, I personally thought that that was an adventure that shared some of the wonder that should be present in a game of Dungeons and Dragons or any fantasy role-playing game, to be honest. Right, so we've got some maps here. Oh, some tactical maps. Nothing that's particular, just some various different maps there. And then Tales from the Shadows, which we're going to take a look at tomorrow. Deep Magic, Vault of Magic, and our open game license. And that is Book of Ebon Tides from Cobalt Press. Of course, it is available for $49.99 in hardcover, just like this. Or you can grab just the PDF alone for $29.99. Of course, I am going to be reviewing this in the near future as well. So I've got a lot of role-playing game stuff on the horizon. Lots of reviews. Got a bunch of stuff that's supposed to be on it on its way to me. I'm not sure because it's a company I have not worked with before. So I don't really want to talk about it and then be like, oh, hey, we're going to get to take a look at XYZ. And then XYZ never shows up. <laughs> so, <laughs> Kabuki Kid says, sounds like you're crazy to get a digital only. All right, MC's got to run. So good to see you. Thanks for uh, swinging on in. And yes, you're very welcome for this first look and page through for Book of Ebon Tides. Tomorrow, I will also talk about the Cobalt Press Kickstarter that launched today. Yes. That's right. We're looking at Book of Ebon Tides. And they launched their Wastes of... I think it's wastes of the wastes of, of the chaos or wastes of chaos. No, I think it's wastes of chaos off the top of my head. I just did a news piece for it today. Duh. It's like, and uh, it is uh, tackling the borderlands. So yes, another setting book and adventure book because the, I, and I think the adventure book is going to have 14 adventures and it is, Tales from the Wastes. So I will have a news piece about that tomorrow. It's already funded. It funded in little less than two hours. 
So tomorrow we're going to actually take a look at Tales from the Shadows from Cobalt Press. This has 14 new adventures suitable for levels 1 to 8, playable separately or in sequence. So that's what's on horizon for tomorrow. Connor Dunning asks, keep on the Borderlands, Borderlands? It's, uh, I would say Borderlands, but keeping in mind, it is the Midgard setting. Although the reality is you can take any of this stuff and plug it into Forgotten Realms or your own homebrew setting, whatever you want. You can pick and choose what you dig, right? And add it in. I, you don't have to use Midgard. So, but I just happen to point out, I think Midgard's pretty cool. Something else I should mention is uh, you don't have to necessarily use this with Dungeons and Dragons either. Remember, I was just talking about how I reviewed the player's handbook for Castles and Crusades. There's absolutely nothing stopping you from using Castles and Crusades with the Cobalt Press releases, even though the Cobalt Press releases are for 5e. It's, it's not that much stuff that, you know, you need to port over. Although you should check out the review. Uh, I talk about how easy I think Castles and Crusades is to take old modules from geez, basic expert, AD&D, probably I would say up to third edition and port them over pretty easily to Castles and Crusades. Far easier to Castles and Crusades than it would be to 5e at least the way I'm looking at it. But, uh, counter Dunning says, yeah, true, true. Yeah. It's a border. It's borderlands. We'll talk about the Kickstarter tomorrow. If you want swing on over to the gaming and, uh, you can check out the news piece that's up there already. So, uh, flaming here points out one reason some people may not get the physical book is shipping cost. Yes. So Kabuki Kid says, yeah, a lot of old school stuff is easy, easy to bring to certain OSR games. And other OSR games are like night and day. I've noticed. It's, it's kind of weird. But the easy thing with Castles and Crusades is your difficulty number normally for like monsters, you know, combat, things like that, are their hit dice. So... That's all you're basically utilizing are their hit dice. Uh, not necessarily, oh, okay, I got to figure out the you know, armor class and everything else. So that is one of the things. I mean, armor comes into play, but it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, it really is pretty easy, at least from what I have seen of Castles and Crusades. And I've read the three, three <laughs> core books. I, uh, I've got a couple more that I need to, to read through so I can get reviews out. But yeah, I was super impressed. Really liked it. All right. Anyway. See anything else going on in chat that I need to address? I don't think so. I think we're okay. I think we are up to date. If I missed saying hello to somebody who popped in, I do apologize. I always try to say howdy to everybody who takes time out to join us in chat. So once again, on tomorrow's show, we're going to take a look at Tales from the Shadows for 5e from Cobalt Press. Remember, it's an adventure book. So if you are a player and you're hoping that your dungeon master slash game master is going to be picking up Tales from the Shadows, you might want to tune out after we talk about the news tomorrow because there might be some spoilers. I'm not going to intentionally spoil anything, but you know, we're taking a look at some pages in it. So you never know. All righty. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the gaming gang channel if you haven't. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when the dispatch streams live Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings, 
at seven o'clock central right here on YouTube. It'll also let you know when I upload other videos, such as my first look at Pathfinder Lost Omens Travel Guide from Paizo Inc. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the channel. Come on, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. If you were watching live, thank you very much. Always appreciate people tuning in. If you took part in chat, big tip of the cap to you. Some extra experience points as well. Pretty soon you're going to get to trade those in, level up. But of course, I know a lot of you out there don't have an opportunity to watch live. doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Thank you very kindly for taking time out of your busy life to watch any of the videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. All right, everybody enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is in your neck of the woods. I'll be back tomorrow. And of course, here's hoping each and every one of you always get to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay. You don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here or take a peek at the latest live stream or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.